Don't call me a hipster. I'm really not. I just love vinyl records. There's something about the scratches and the pops and the ambient fuzz that makes me feel a stronger connection to the music. My mother got me a Crosley turntable for Christmas four years ago, and ever since, my love for dusty old records has grown wild. I pick up new records at Goodwill. I go out on record store day and buy them by the dozen. Sometimes, as is true of this story, I find a jackpot at garage sales. The weather is warming up and garage sale season is in full swing. But when I took home a milk crate full of old jazz and blues LPs, I never expected sheer terror to come of it. I handpicked them all. Miles Davis, Sonny Rollins, and Art Tatum. And as I thumbed through the warped, old sleeves, I found one that I didn't remember buying. The sleeve was black with no title or artist's name. Water damaged head caused it to get that splotchy, malted look that old cardboard gets. I slid the record out of the sleeve and found the vinyl itself in similarly poor condition. Dust was caked on its black face and the grooves were worn deep. The sticker at the centre of the record was scratched away, revealing no more clues to identify it. It was nearing bedtime, so... I figured I would slap it on the turntable and give it a spin before I hit the sack. I pulled the arm until I heard the click and the old record began to spin. When I dropped the needle on the outer rim, I was greeted by the nostalgia inducing static that I had grown so fond of. I expected more jazz, but what came out of the speakers was pure chaos. A garbled hiss was lost in heavy static and a sudden shrill screech made my ears ring somewhere in the cacophony i could make out the sound of voices the voice in the foreground sounded distant and muffled i leaned close to the speaker to decipher the words but it was as if the singer were speaking gibberish the words were at once familiar but completely alien the hairs of my forearms stood. Goosebumps ran up and down my skin. I lifted the needle abruptly off the record and turned the turntable off. Whatever I had just listened to was clearly not the original. Excessive wearing and warping of the vinyl must have turned whatever music there was into a murky mess of noise and jumbled syllables. I shrugged and settled into bed. That god awful noise had given me an instant headache and I needed to lie down. I'm the kind of person that can only fall asleep if I'm surrounded by complete darkness and silence. I allow no music or television in my room once I'm under the covers. So imagine how startled I was when, two hours later, I was awoken by the sound of the turntable switching on. Somehow, the needle had fallen onto the spinning vinyl, and I lay in the dark, listening to the fuzz that surrounded the start of the record. I tried to sit up, but I found myself unable to command my limbs. Was this sleep paralysis? I tried to wiggle my toes, but the effort was futile. I lay there, glued in place, staring at the glowing red power lights of the record player out of the corner of my eye. This time, however, the jumbled mess of noise and gibberish did not play off the mysterious record. Instead, a single voice, loud and clear as water, came pouring out of the speakers. It was a male's voice, and he wasn't singing. No, he was just speaking, calmly casually, with an air of irreverence. I don't know why I do it, the voice said. I mean, don't get me wrong, I want to do it. I love it. I certainly don't try to stop myself. I lay there, breathing, unable to budge a single muscle in my body. In the silence between the speaker's slow pace, I found myself 
staring into the dark, accompanied only by the dull fuzz of the hissing vinyl. Well, there was one time, the voice said, that I didn't mean to do it. My mom. That was an act of uncontrolled passion. No, no, no. I didn't wake up wanting to kill her, kill her, kill her. It was a combination of adrenaline and convenience. I had the knife. She had that paper-thin skin. It was an equation so simple. I couldn't leave it unsolved. Was I dreaming this? It was the only explanation. As the speaker went on, I heard the click of the speed controller send the record spinning from 33 RPMs to 45 RPMs, and then again to 75. As the record spun faster, the speaker's voice grew high-pitched and the words spewed out of him at supersonic speed. Now after that was Nancy, my girlfriend at the time, and that one I knew full well what I was doing. God, the blood was everywhere. 32 stabs to the head. The blood was all matted in her hair like a mop head full of cranberry juice. The speed controller clicked back to 45 RPMs. Sheila. I met her at a music festival. At first, I just planned to screw her. I didn't know. Back down to 33 RPMs. At the time that I was going to drag her by the hair out of the woods and bash her skull with a rock. That one was a surprise, even to me. Not that I didn't enjoy it, enjoy it, enjoy it. The record was skipping again. Then the speed controller switched up to 45 RPMs. The speaker began to laugh. It was a deep, throaty laugh that seemed to go on so long that I didn't know whether the vinyl was skipping or the man was savouring the chuckle. I was trembling uncontrollably. What twisted psychopath had recorded this? Why was it tucked into the milk crate that I picked up at the garage sale? Should I call the police? How am I going to call 911 when I can't even get out of bed? Now you. Yeah, you. I've been planning yours for a while. The speaker was talking to someone else who had remained silent through the whole tirade. I've been watching your house for weeks. That back window you always leave unlocked. You used to really put a nail in it. Even if you lock it, a screwdriver will do the trick. The record sped up to 45 RPMs. And then I'll have a screwdriver in my hand. Nasty way to go. The air in the room became inextricably chilled. I shivered, despite the heavy comforter I was trapped under. My fingertips were tingling. Funny thing is, funny thing is, funny thing is. The speed slowed again, just as the record began to skip. You don't even realize I'm talking to you. You know how easy it is to follow someone home, home, home. The words he spoke next terrified me so thoroughly that I jolted out of my paralysis and flailed my way off the mattress, clawing the blankets off my body. You know how easy it is to follow someone home from a garage sale? The turntable clicked and the record stopped spinning as the record came to an end. I had always loved horror movies. In my younger days, I may not have realised it, but I was a glutton for the terror that films would instil in me. I subconsciously loved how they kept me up at night. Small, fearful eyes scanning my bedroom shadows for whatever sort of creature may be calling the darkness its home. It was to the point where I would wake up in the early hours of the morning, around 1am or so to sneak into the living room and watch the late night screamers that would air. Often, I would get caught by my mother or father about half an hour into my shenanigans, seated on the couch and wrapped up in my blankie, while clutching a teddy bear with eyes fixated on the television screen. 
I would be sent to bed immediately, told that my punishment would come in the morning. It never did. My parents, too tired at the time to actually remember apprehending me. On a rare occasion though, I'd managed to make it all the way through the film, from the time I'd slipped into the couch to the moment the credits rolled. At that moment, the trudge back to my bedroom was a mad dash of fright, trying to evade any and all monsters or bugaboos that, in my impressionable mind, would grab me and take me away. I was always successful in the return trip. It made me feel like Indiana Jones. I don't love horror movies anymore. Not after what happened. I was in college when the event occurred. While most people associate university with wild parties, copious amounts of alcohol, and finding as many people to have anonymous sex with, my version of the experience was more tame by those standards. The evenings not spent furiously poring over my projects and classwork were spent with my one true love, my Netflix account. From the moment my last class of the day ended, I was wrapped in the sweet embrace the internet had waiting for me. I would return to my dorm, slip into my bedroom and into something more comfortable, and spend until about 4 in the morning watching whatever horrors the streaming site had available to me. For the price of $7.99 a month, it was the best and most cheap addiction I'd ever encountered. The people I chose to interact with when I wasn't glued to my laptop were often of the same ilk that I was. Individuals who were just as obsessive over movies. We loved to be scared, and we often spoke of it. We compared reviews, discussed theories, and often got together to partake in these pieces of nightmare fuel, usually once a week on Saturday in a grand marathon session that was catered by the local pizza place, and a large snack trip beforehand to prepare for when we were sick of the smell of grease and cheese. Many of us were members of a horror enthusiast forum to meet and talk with more people who shared our twisted ideas of entertainment. I've since removed myself completely from that site. Due to the vast duration of time that I'd been with my Netflix account, I'd practically exhausted their selection of movies to stream that were of my tastes. I'd watch the classics, the cult favourites, the flops, the silence, the screamers, the spookers, the slashes, the foreign. Short of paying extra for a DVD plan, my partner in crime was becoming repetitive. I'd even resorted to watching the one stars, the films that were too terrible to even consider horror, but still somehow made the list. Filled with poor crafted CG effects that were more terrifying than the monsters they were trying to scare me with. I lamented this to my forum mates, complaining of the lack of fresh choices upon the site that filled my browser history. Many of my friends from school were having the same problems and were voicing their woes within the same thread that I had begun. Looking back on it, I realise now that this was the worst mistake I could have made. Had I not started that thread, some of us might still remain among the living, finding new ways to garner our thrills. Scream Queen 69 her username from the forum, as I won't refer to anyone by their true name to protect families had approached us at the meeting grounds the following day. Our usual location of gathering was behind a campus building, an area of concrete that sloped downwards to a door that, we all assumed, led to the art department basement. The top of the wall that enclosed our cold stone hill blocked off by a fence so none could accidentally fall and injure themselves. As our group sat and talked, SQ arrived looking a little worse for wear. There were dark circles under her eyes, looking tired, and her face was pale. She often looked so bright and sun-kissed, full of energy. She had said that shortly after she posted on the forums the night before, she'd been contacted by another member, asking if she wanted to watch something that, as she spoke and gave air quotes with her fingers, would changed the genre for her forever. 
and then proceeded to send her a link to the obscure site she'd never heard of before. Tween Wolf rolled his eyes, suggesting that they were only trying to suggest a film for her to watch and that she was being crazy for ignoring them. I was growing concerned. However, as she recounted that, though she originally ignored the person, they sent her messages constantly afterwards. They started out mild enough, along the lines of, Did you watch it yet? And, What did you think? And, as the night went on, they got more violent. SQ showed me the chat history, and towards the end, it seemed that her chat partner, named Behind You, was getting more and more agitated. The messages were becoming desperate. Did you click the link yet? You should click the link. You won't regret it. Click the link. Click the damn link already. Click the link. 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 Click. It was at that point that I grew incredibly concerned for my friend. No one else had received these messages. Only her. My only advice to her was to ignore it and perhaps stay off the site for a few days. If this person didn't see her online, perhaps they would lose interest and back off. It wasn't the case, however, as SQ would come to us for the next couple of days, looking more and more haggard, saying that she couldn't rest at night. Behind you was still messaging her, and at this point, it was just a repeat of the original link, pasted over and over and over. She was starting to get emails sent to a school email account. She didn't know how they'd gotten it. Her email address wasn't listed on the forum, and it wasn't even the same one she'd registered to the site with. The sender would be blank, the subject line empty, and the message was always the same. Click the link. Her inbox was flooded with at least a hundred emails by the time she returned from classes, all the same. And the texts, an unknown number of all zeros, at all hours of the day, click the link. Even when a phone was on silent, the sound would still ring. It was turned off and it would ring. She would remove the battery completely and still be startled by the noise of a text tone. She had submerged the phone in water to try and damage it and get rid of the noises. Still, it rang. She had put it into the microwave and turned it on for five minutes, knowing that if the appliance was broke, she would have to pay for a replacement, seeing as the appliance was provided by the dorm building. Even burnt and melted in places, the battery removed and fried. It rang. It was getting to the point where SQ was growing more and more frazzled, each and every cell phone going off around her, causing her to shriek. By the fifth day, she hadn't shown up to lunch. Most of us assumed she was just trying to catch up on sleep from the incident keeping her up at night. We didn't realize she had died until two days later when her roommate complained about the smell coming from her room. The police blocked off the dorm room, and her roommate was moved out to live with someone else in the building. They ruled it as a suicide, claiming that SQ had overdosed on sleeping pills. She had been found slumped over her desk in front of a laptop, with a forum pulled up on a browser. I had managed to worm my way into her room a few days after cleanup had ended. Her family lived on the other side of the country and wouldn't be in for another day or two to gather her things, and I'd convinced the building RA that Scream Queen 69 had been in possession of a few of my items, and I just needed to get them back before they were mistakenly removed with their belongings. The RA had left me there, saying that the doors would lock behind me once I left. Alone in the room where my friend had passed, I removed the laptop from a desk not wanting to sit in a death throne, and moved it over to the bed. SQ never kept her item's password protected, and left self logged in on everything, so 
it was easy enough to turn the computer on and navigate my way back to the very forum she had been looking at when she died. I'd found my way into a I'd found my way to her inbox, looking at hundreds of messages from a apparent stalker, when I noticed something different. Out of the mass of links, one of them was purple. It had been clicked. I grew curious. What was it about this movie that made this person so obsessive to show it to SQ? Was it the thing that had driven SQ to kill herself? I clicked the link. At first, nothing seemed out of the ordinary. The video was dark, as though it were trying to slowly process the images. The things were starting to come into focus. A desk, posters on the wall, a person sitting on the bed, a person standing behind them with a large, toothy grin. It was at this point I realised I was staring at my own face, sitting in Eskew's bedroom, her posters behind me. The webcam light was on. My cousin recently moved here from Secunderabad, India. On a recent road trip exploring America, we were talking and exchanging ghost stories and laughing at the similarities and differences between American ghost stories and Indian ghost stories. When I asked her if she's ever experienced anything supernatural, her eyes widened as she averted her eyes to the window. Just when the silence was about to be too much for me, she softly responded. Yes. A few. One is troubling. When I was in second year in college, I stayed in an all-girl hostel. I made many friends. We were all very happy to be in school, away from our conservative parents. The hostel was so much fun, but it was a very, very old building. Electricity was only put in the rooms. Sometimes, candles were placed along the windows if a watchman was present, but normally, once you left the rooms, you were faced with complete darkness. It was common to wake up someone if you needed to walk down to the restroom at the end of the hall. We all had a childish fear of being alone in the dark. One night, I had to use the restroom. It was about 4am. I went to my friend's bed and tapped her on her arm. She immediately opened her eyes as soon as I touched her. I apologized for bothering her and told her I needed to pee. She smiled at me and hopped out of bed. All the way down the hallway, she laughed and danced. I could not see her at all, but her bangles clanged together loudly and the bells on her anklets jingled softly. It was very calming. I laughed and sashayed my hips down the hallway with her too tired to match elaborate arm movements. She said nothing to me, though occasionally I heard her hum one of our favourite Bollywood songs. The same thing happened on our return. I fell back asleep easily. I awoke fairly late the next morning to the sound of men in our room. They surrounded her bed. I bolted from my bed, prepared to protect my friend when I realised they were administrators of the college. I peered over closely. My friend's lifeless eyes were fixated on my bed, the same smile on her face. Suicide. Her time of death was 11.30pm, almost five hours before I woke her. There is a hunter in the woods who, after a long day of hunting, was in the middle of an immense forest. It was getting dark and, having lost his bearings, he decided to head in one direction until he was clear of the increasingly oppressive foliage. After what seemed like hours, he came across a cabin in a small clearing. 
realizing how dark it had grown, he decided to see if he could stay there for the night. He approached and found the door ajar. Nobody was inside. The hunter flopped down on the single bed, deciding to explain himself to the owner in the morning. As he looked around, he was surprised to see the walls adorned by many portraits, all painted in incredible detail. Without exception, they all appeared to be staring down at him, their features twisted into looks of hatred. Staring back, he grew increasingly uncomfortable, making a concerted effort to ignore the many hateful faces. He turned to face the wall, and exhausted, he fell into a restless sleep. Face down in an unfamiliar bed, he turned blinking in unexpected sunlight. Looking up, he discovered that the cabin had no portraits, only windows. A man went to a hotel and walked up to the front desk to check in. The woman at the desk gave him his key and told him that, on the way to his room, there was a door with no number that was locked, and no one was allowed inside there. Especially, no one should look inside the room, under any circumstances. So, he followed the instructions of the woman at the front desk, going straight to his room, and going to bed. The next night, his curiosity would not leave him alone about the room with no number on the door. He walked down the hallway to the door and tried the handle. Sure enough, it was locked. He bent down and looked through the wide keyhole. Cold air passed through it, chilling his eye. What he saw was a hotel bedroom, like his, and in the corner was a woman whose skin was completely white. She was leaning her head against the wall, facing away from the door. He stared in confusion for a while. He almost knocked on the door out of curiosity, but decided not to. This disinclination saved his life. He crept away from the door and walked back to his room. The next day, he returned to the door and looked through the wide keyhole. This time, all he saw was redness. He couldn't make anything out besides a distinct red colour, unmoving. Perhaps the inhabitants of the room knew he was spying the night before, and had blocked the keyhole with something red. At this point, he decided to consult the woman at the front desk for more information. She sighed slightly and said, Did you look through the keyhole? The man told her he had, and she said, Well, I might as well tell you the story. A long time ago, a man murdered his wife in that room, and a ghost haunts it. But these people were not ordinary. They were white all over, except for their eyes, which were red. In January 2006 in New York, the patient of a well-known psychiatrist draws the face of a man that has been repeatedly appearing in her dreams. In more than one occasion, that man has given her advice on her private life. The woman swears she has never met the man in her life. That portrait lies forgotten on the psychiatrist's desk for a few days until one day, another patient recognizes that face and says that the man has often visited him in his dreams. He also claims he has never seen that man in his waking life. The psychiatrist decides to send the portrait to some of his colleagues that have patients with recurrent dreams. Within a few months, four patients recognize the man as a frequent presence in their own dreams. All the patients refer to him as this man. From January 2006 until today, at least 2,000 people have claimed they have seen this man in their dreams in many cities all over the world. Los Angeles, Berlin, Sao Paulo, Tehran, Beijing, Rome, Barcelona, Stockholm, Paris, New Delhi, Moscow, etc. At the moment, there is no ascertained relation 
or common traits among the people that have dreamed of seeing this man. Moreover, no living man has ever been recognized as resembling the man of the portrait by the people who have seen this man in their dreams. A young girl walking home from school found a small pile of Polaroid photos lying in the gutter. There were 20 in all, neatly wrapped in a rubber band. She picked them up and, as she walked, she started to browse. The first photo was that of a ghostly white man on a black background, standing just far away from the camera that she couldn't make out his features. The girl slid the photo to the back of the stack and looked at the next one. The photo was of the same man, now standing a bit closer. The girl flipped through the next several photos quickly. With each one, the man in the photo came a bit closer, and his features were a bit clearer. Turning the last corner to her house, the girl noticed that the man in the photos seems to be looking at her, even when she moved the stack from side to side. It frightened her, but she kept flipping them over, one by one. By the 19th picture, the man was so close, his face completely filled the frame. His expression was the most horrific the girl had ever seen. Walking up the driveway, she turned to the last photo. This time, instead of an image, there were two words. Close enough. Hearing a scream outside the house, the girl's brother rushed to the door and opened it. All he saw was a pile of photographs lying on the doorstep. The top one looked like an extremely pale version of his sister, but she was standing too far back for him to be sure. In 1983, a team of deeply pious scientists conducted a radical experiment in an undisclosed facility. The scientists had theorized that a human, without access to any senses or ways to perceive stimuli, would be able to perceive the presence of God. They believed that the five senses clouded our awareness of eternity, and without them, a human could actually establish contact with God by thought. An elderly man, who claimed to have nothing left to live for, was the only test subject to volunteer. To purge him of all his senses, the scientists performed a complex operation in which Every sensory nerve connection to the brain was surgically severed. Although the test subjects retained full muscular function, he could not see, hear, taste, smell, or feel. With no possible way to communicate with or even sense the outside world, he was alone with his thoughts. Scientists monitored him as he spoke aloud about his state of mind in jumbled, slurred sentences that he couldn't even hear. After four days, the man claimed to be hearing hushed, unintelligible voices in his head. Assuming it was an onset of psychosis, the scientists paid little attention to the man's concerns. Two days later, the man cried that he could hear his dead wife speaking with him, and even more, he could communicate back. The scientists were intrigued but were not convinced until the subject started naming dead relatives of the scientists. He repeated personal information to the scientists that only their dead spouses and parents would have known. At this point, a sizable portion of scientists left the study. After a week of conversing with the deceased through his thoughts, the subject became distressed, saying the voices were overwhelming in every waking moment, his consciousness was bombarded by hundreds of voices that refused to leave him alone. He frequently threw himself against the wall, trying to elicit a pain response. He begged the scientists for sedatives so he could escape the voices by sleeping. This tactic only worked for three days, until he started having severe night terrors. 
The subject repeatedly said that he could see and hear the deceased in his dreams. Only one day later, the subject began to scream and claw at his non-functional eyes, hoping to sense something in the physical world. The hysterical subject now said the voices of the dead were deafening and hostile, speaking of hell and the end of the world. At one point, he yelled, no heaven, no forgiveness, for five hours straight. He continually begged to be killed, but the scientists were convinced that he was close to establishing contact with God. After another day, the subject could no longer form coherent sentences. Seemingly mad, he started to bite off chunks of flesh from his arm. The scientists rushed to the test chamber and restrained him to a table so he could not kill himself. After a few hours of being tied down, the subject halted his struggling and screaming. He stared blankly at the ceiling as teardrops silently streaked across his face. For two weeks, the subject had to be manually rehydrated due to the constant crying. Eventually, he turned his head and, despite his blindness, made focused eye contact with the scientist for the first time in the study. He whispered, I have spoken with God, and he has abandoned us. And his vital signs stopped. There was no apparent cause of death. There was a middle-aged woman who was very fat and desperately wanted to lose weight. She had tried all sorts of fad diets, but none of them seemed to work. Exercise was definitely out of the question because she was just too lazy, and she lacked the willpower to force herself to eat less. One day, she was leafing through a magazine when she came across an advertisement for her diet pills. Guaranteed weight loss in just two weeks, said the ad. The company was selling the diet pills over the internet, so the woman decided to order a month's supply. A few days later, she received a package in the mail. When she opened it, she was surprised to see that it only contained 12 large pills. The instructions said that she would take one pill per month, with a glass of water, and afterwards, she should avoid eating spicy food or drinking alcohol. The woman popped the dye pill into her mouth and swallowed it down. A few days later, she noticed that her appetite had completely disappeared. She didn't feel hungry at all. Even though she didn't do any exercise, she was beginning to shed the pounds. As the days went on, she quickly began losing more and more weight. Within no time, she was admiring her slim new body in the mirror. The change was stunning. She had gone from a pear shape to an hourglass figure in no time at all. Unfortunately, the diet pills proved to be more effective than she had expected. Even though she was down to her target weight, she continued to get thinner and thinner. Soon she was feeling tired and weak, and she had sharp abdominal pains. The pain finally became so intense that she was forced to go to the hospital. A doctor examined her and became alarmed. After taking an x-ray of her stomach, he asked her if she had eaten anything strange lately. No, replied the woman. I've barely eaten anything at all since I started taking my diet pills. The doctor asked to see the bottle of pills. He broke one capsule open and brought the contents down to the laboratory to be analyzed. When he returned, he had some rather troublesome news for the woman. The diet pills contain the eggs of a tapeworm. Fingers trembling with excitement, I opened the package. Just as I had hoped, it was the camera I won from eBay. With mild delight, I realized I had received a better deal than I had planned because the previous owner had left the memory card in the slot. Before sending an email to the seller alerting them of the mistake, I decided to see if anything was on it. Setting the camera on slideshow, 
I watched as the camera displayed a picture of a shipping label. My confusion turned to horror as the next image was of a person brutally murdered. The rest of the card was alternating pictures of a mailing address followed by a murder scene. The last image was of the shipping label from the box I had just opened. It was the 2nd of January, 2.04am. I woke up to a knocking on the door, one knock every three seconds. I slipped on my slippers and walked down the stairs. As I walked down, the knocking on the door got faster, almost like a heartbeat. When I got to the door, the knocking stopped. I looked outside and nobody was there. I went back up to my room and went back to bed, thinking it was just some kids playing a prank. At 4.21am, I woke up to the front door slamming shut. I jumped, terrified. I looked over at my frosted window to find smile written all over it in the frost. I grabbed my phone next to me, ready to call 911, only to find a message written on it saying, I told you to smile. I cried and ran for my life, running outside. As soon as I got outside, I knocked to my neighbor's house across the road. They answered and held me while I sobbed. They phoned the police. At exactly 5.42, the police came to my neighbor's house after an extensive search of my house. They told me there had been no evidence at all of anyone in my house other than me. The messages on the window were gone, same with my phone. They told me to get some sleep and advised me to see a doctor about stress and anxiety problems. Screw that, I knew what happened to me was real. The following event, after spending the day at my neighbours, I went home. I went up to my room and set up a camera. It was aimed at my bedroom door and my bed. I set it to record and went to sleep. Thankfully, I slept through the night. However, as I watched the footage, I couldn't believe what I saw. At three in the morning, something crawled out from under my bed. It was a completely naked, anorexic man. He stood up and looked at me on the bed. He did so for another hour not moving at all. Then, he moved. He walked over to the camera until his face took up the whole shot. He was extremely pale and had bulging veins all over his head. His eyes were completely black with a huge smile on his face. He stared at the camera for another two hours, not blinking, just slightly twisting his head every now and again. After two hours of him staring went past, he walked back over to my bed and crawled back under. I skipped the video forward until it showed me getting up and walking over to the camera. The video finished. I was frozen with fear. The video showed him going back under, but not leaving. Whatever it was, it was still there. Does anyone remember an old PC game from the early 1990s called Mr. Mix? It's mainly a typing game, similar to Mario Teacher's Typing, where you have to type words into a box to make a chef, the titular Mr. Mix, put ingredients into a bowl. Unlike most typing games, however, this game is notorious for having an insane difficulty curve. The game has a words per minute requirement for each level, being as low as 10 on level 1 and as high as 85 on the third. By level 5, the requirement reaches over 500, effectively making it impossible to proceed any further. 
One of the main things that people noticed about this game immediately was the background music. The music on the first level was an unsettling pattern of growls that got progressively louder as the level went on, often causing damage to early computer speakers that were not designed to handle extremely high volumes of sound. The second level had no sound at all, and the third had what sounded like an extremely low quality recording of a hairdryer playing in the background. The remaining two levels had an extremely loud, high-pitched ringing throughout the level that caused severe eardrum damage to those who managed to get that far. Another rather disturbing aspect of the game was the design of Mr. Mix himself. He was a large, round-faced, overweight man with large, beady eyes and red spots on his cheeks. Most children who played the game reported having vivid nightmares of Mr. Mix speaking to them in a quiet, raspy voice and threatening them to keep quiet about something. However, none of them could remember exactly what that was. One psychologist who saw many of these children reported being disturbed by the sheer amount of terror on the faces of the children as they recounted the details of the nightmare. Many of the children broke down into tears in the process, begging for their parents to save them. However, no direct relationship to the game itself could be determined by these few cases, as not all children suffered the same adverse effects. For obvious reasons, this game did not sell very well. It remained in relative obscurity until a few years ago, when PC hackers got hold of a ROM of the game and started digging through it. Using memory hacking software, they managed to crack the game's code and bypass the impossible fifth level. What they found, however, was extremely disturbing and caused many of them to quit the expedition altogether. According to the reports these hackers left behind, the game behaves very strangely if the fifth level is bypassed. The game crashes violently and closes, writing a bunch of files in the user's System32 directory to the point that the RAM was almost completely filled. These files are reportedly pictures of people with horribly deformed faces, appearing to scream in pain and agony with their eyes appearing to be bleeding from their tear ducts and their outer layer of skin torn clean in multiple places. If the user attempts to delete these files, the computer will violently crash and blue screen, causing permanent irreparable damage to the user's hard drive. The hackers found that this was caused by a lone byte in the game's ROM that triggered when the fifth level was completed. After removing this byte, they were able to proceed to the sixth and final level. Unfortunately, all of the original hackers declined to discuss what they saw in the final level. All of them became extremely paranoid and reclusive, refusing to talk about anything related to the game and showing astonishingly extreme symptoms of post-traumatic stress disorder. Most of them ceased to be able to form coherent sentences within a week and, within a month, all of them went missing. All the remaining copies of the game were destroyed. To this day, no one knows what was in that game that caused them so much psychological damage. Maybe it's better that way. Two years after this incident, a man was arrested after trying to kidnap an eight-year-old girl from a grocery store. Through DNA and fingerprint analysis, the man was identified as one of the original hackers who viewed the final level of the game. He was wearing a white chef's hat and had a look of unspeakable malice and insanity on his face. When interrogated, the man would only say one thing. I'm Mr. Mix. Shh. These days, when people ask me if I have any siblings, I just say no.
But I used to. Just for a while. Tommy was my little brother, and by the time he was three, we were best buddies. I remember how we used to wake up about 5am on Saturdays to watch cartoons and kick up a hell of a ruckus until mom and dad booted us out of the house. Then we'd go play on our swing set, or maybe try to skip some stones at the creek, or just run around. But he got sick that next fall. It wasn't anything too bad, just a common cold. Or so we thought. My parents didn't really do anything about it. They just figured they'd let it run its course. Poor kid. Probably went through a pack and a half of Kleenex a day. But that didn't help any. He was sneezing every other minute, spewing his snot all over the place. And I wouldn't have spent much time around him if my parents didn't make me. That's how we ended up in the garage that day. We went out to run around, but because of his cold, Tommy got tired after just a few minutes. We were heading back inside when he sneezed on me. Call it the straw that broke the camel's back. All of a sudden, he started yelling about his cold and how gross it was to sneeze on everything and everyone. He sneezed on me again, and that's when he really lost it. My dad had a pegboard of tools on the wall. Tommy reached up and grabbed the hammer. Then he hit himself in the face with it, a good four or five times. Smack, 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 until he was down. Then he hit himself again, and again, and again. Smack, 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 crunch. I think I was in shock until then. I literally couldn't believe what had just happened. When I did, I went to help Tommy, but I stopped when I got closer to him. I tried to write about what his face looked like a few times. Couldn't do it. All I can say is that his nose was smashed, along with his teeth and the front of his face. His skull was basically opened up. But something was moving in there. Something moved past a part of his skull. And for a while, I thought it was a huge living bugger. And in a way, it was. It was a slug. The first of a few that the doctors said were living in his nasal cavity. All the slime they were producing. That's what was making him sneeze so much. Because of the way it happened, I think my parents told everyone that Tommy died in an accident. I'm not really sure and they're not really around for me to ask them what they said. My friends from school didn't buy that, so when they asked about how Tommy really died, I told them the same thing that I told the cops, which is the crap I just said. But that's not how Tommy really, really died. See. Tommy couldn't have reached that hammer, but me, I could. It had been a while since I visited my cousins. Believe it or not, it had been five years since I saw any of their faces. The last time I saw them, I was eight years old and had not yet learnt that the world had no consequences. I skipped gaily around their two-storey ramshackle house joyously, singing my favourite songs and playing with the six-year-old twins. This playtime, however, was constantly tainted by my Aunt Clarissa. My Aunt Clarissa was always that one person with which everything had to be just right, perfect or as close to perfect as possible. Whenever I would try play tag, hide and seek, or anything of the sort really, she would be hovering over us, her dark grey eyes flashing. She would always say, Now Jared, don't you ever play too rough with Simon or Eloise. If anything were to happen to them, I'd wear you out. Aunt Clarissa always used to scare me as a child, with a sharp chin and stormy eyes. She reminded me 
of a witch. I did not dare do anything she wouldn't approve of with Simon or Eloise, even when she wasn't around, because I knew that she would stay true to her word and beat me black and blue if I were to ever harm either of them. Her precious little twins had to be perfect and untouched. We used to visit her all the time back at my old house. We only lived about 30 minutes away from each other. Then my dad got a job offer up in Michigan, and it was a long time before I ever stepped foot in Illinois. I do remember feeling happy, at the very least, for my Aunt Clarissa as we left, despite my disliking her. She was about to have another child, and she was joyful as could be. Her eyes weren't as stormy as they usually were the last time that we went to visit them to say goodbye, and she seemed as content and relaxed as ever with the growing bulge in her stomach. Three was the perfect number. Three perfect children in a wonderful family. This was all Aunt Clarissa had ever wanted. We all moved to Detroit and, eight months later, the big news came. Aunt Clarissa had had a baby. She sent us a letter with several exclamation points telling us how happy she was for her newborn child, who she named Mallory. Even now, when I'm 17 years old, I still remember thinking that it was odd she had not sent a photograph of her infant child. The years whisked by like sand and wind, and the more time went by, the less contact we had with our cousins, Aunt Clarissa and my Uncle Wayne. Then, finally, we were invited over to her house for the holidays. My mother, who missed her older sister dreadfully, readily agreed to visit, and my father, seeing how eager my mother was, complied with her wishes. After a two-day car trip, we finally got to the familiar old residence of my aunt uncle, and their three children. We all approached the steps, laughing and talking to each other before reaching the door and knocking. A full minute later, we were still standing there, fidgeting and stealing glances at each other. The door suddenly opened about a foot. The face of an eleven-year-old boy appeared at the door. His white blonde hair hung down over his baggy green eyes which flitted around at us, taking in our every detail. His jaw finally quivered slightly before he said to us, Come in, please, it's so nice to see you all. After five years, Simon had definitely changed. He was more solemn, as if he had been consistently bullied and expected contempt from everyone. My mother wasted no time, smiling and gushing. Why, Simon, come here and give me a hug. Simon allowed himself to be hugged before taking us all inside, where we were greeted by Aunt Clarissa. She smiled, saying, It's so nice to see you all again, before spreading her arms and coming in to give us all hugs. She commented on how much I had grown up and asked me if I had taken care of my parents. I smiled uneasily and replied that I had done the best I could. I looked hard at Aunt Clarissa, taking in how she had changed. She really had not changed very much. There were grey streaks in her otherwise blonde hair, but that appeared to be it. I asked where her uncle Wayne was, and she responded that he was on a business trip and wouldn't be back in some time. She led us into the dining room, where Mallory and Eloise had already sat down. My mother crooned over Mallory and introduced herself while Dad commented on how much Eloise has changed. Mallory didn't look at all like the rest of the family. Her hair was a dirty blonde, and her eyes were not green or grey, but instead a light blue. I did not really talk to her, but instead focused on Eloise who had grown much older and prettier than I had last seen her. She barely remembered me, but I was able to make small talk with her. I noticed she had grown to be wary and suspicious of others, 
as if someone might try to stab her in the back. The only members of the family that seemed normal were Aunt Clarissa and Mallory. Mallory was happily eating away at steamed carrots and Aunt Clarissa was sat on a chair with a pleased look on her face, as if proud of her perfect children. There was definitely tension in the air, as if there had recently been a fight between Aunt Clarissa and her kids. I decided that I would ask Eloise about it after dinner. I met up with her in the living room and sat down. She was engrossed in a teenage magazine I had never heard of, but looked up sharply as soon as the question was out of my mouth. Eloise, is there anything wrong in this house? Her sea green eyes flitted to two different places, somewhere behind me, before meeting my own. I made a mental note of this. There's nothing wrong here, why would you say that? She answered, forcing a smile onto her face. I shook my head. Never mind, I thought Simon was acting unusual. I saw a split second of relief cross her face before she managed to hide it. It's nothing, don't worry about him, he gets bullied sometimes by older kids. I nodded and continued to talk to Eloise, but my mind was elsewhere. I swiftly concluded our conversation and got up. Turning around as I did so, I quickly surveyed the living room, looking for places Eloise had been glancing at. Those two places were the coat closet and the stairwell. I knew that something was wrong with this family, inside this house. It was something that kept eluding me that I couldn't quite put my finger on. It was definitely frustrating. I decided that I would find out tonight, after everyone had gone to bed. I was to be sharing a room with Simon, and Mum and Dad would be taking the spare room upstairs. I did my best to act normal and socialise with everyone, given the unsettling atmosphere of the house. My parents did not appear to notice anything. They were oblivious to how strange our cousins were acting. I think my mum was glad to finally be talking to a sister for after five years of not seeing each other. And my dad seemed and my dad just seemed to be happy for my mother. Finally, it was time to go to bed. We all brushed our teeth and changed into our pajamas. Simon had allowed me to use his bed, and he popped down on the floor. The moonlight streaming in through the window illuminated his face. I relaxed my breathing pretended to fall asleep, while watching Simon, waiting for him to nod off. But he did not. I stared at him for hours as he lay there on the ground, his eyes never closing. Every muscle in his body was pulled taut, as if he were expecting someone to break into the room and attack him. At one in the morning, his breathing relaxed, and he became limp. I crept out of the room and headed for the coat closet, a small flashlight in hand that I had stolen from Simon's drawer. I tiptoed silently over the hardwood floor, wincing every time it creaked. I finally made it to the coat closet and opened the door. Turning on the flashlight, I stepped inside. It looked like a regular coat closet, Nothing special or extraordinary about it. I began rummaging around, checking the coat pockets and even Aunt Clarissa's purse. But all I came across was a Swiss army knife in Simon's pocket and some scented germex in Eloise's jeans jacket, but nothing more. I began to search in the more unusual places, checking in dark corners and even in the shoe rack. But I didn't find anything of interest. I started looking underneath the baskets in which various gloves and hats were kept on a shelf above the coat rack. To my surprise, a newspaper article fluttered down to the floor. I bent over and picked it up. The article read, Female infant stolen from orphanage. My curiosity increased. Why would Aunt Clarice have something like this in her coat closet? I took the article into my back pocket and went on to the second thing I had seen Eloise looking at. 
the stairs. I remembered when I was little, Simon and Eloise had a hide and seek place that beat me every time. They would simply hide in the cupboard underneath the stairs. Every time I passed the cupboard, I would stop, not wanting to go inside to the darkness of the cupboard where unspeakable monsters surely awaited me. I would search every nook and cranny of the house, hoping there would be somewhere else before eventually giving up, even though I really knew where my cousins were. Using that method, they'd beat me time and time again until I eventually tired of hide and seek and proclaimed that we should play tag instead. They had rearranged the furniture so the couch now blocked the cupboard underneath the stairs, but I knew for sure it was still there. I looked down on the ground and noticed something strange. There were scuff marks on the ground, as if the couch had been pulled away from the stairs often. I knew that whatever was under those stairs was the answer to why everyone in the house was so tense, and I was eager to find out the secret. I pushed the couch away from the staircase and stepped over the cupboard beneath the stairs. To my surprise, the cupboard was secured with a thick padlock. I went back to the coat closet and retrieved Simon's small knife. I inserted the thin blade into the handle and jiggled it around until the lock clicked open. My heart began to pound feverishly in my chest as I unhooked the padlock and swung the small door open. I shone the flashlight in the dark area beneath the stairs. My flashlight passed over a chain dangling from the low ceiling of the right hand end of the small space provided by the cupboard and I moved my flashlight down to discover a human hand in a manacle. A shocked little grasp escaped my throat and my blood ran cold. I reached up and flicked the switch to the small light bulb dangling from the ceiling. Before me, a girl no less than nine years old, was hanging from the manacles on the ceiling, clad in nothing but a pair of dirty undershorts. Her head lolled to one side, a rag was stuffed in her mouth, and her ankles was tied in thick rope. Her wrists and skin around her feet were red and sore from being bound, and I could tell from the length of her face and how small her eyes were that she suffered from Down syndrome. Her skin was seemingly pulled over her bones and her ribs stuck out. For a horrible moment, I thought that she was dead. But then, her head raised and a horrible moaning escaped her throat through the rag in her mouth. Looking to the other side of the cupboard, revulsion welled up in the pit of my stomach. Sprawled out in the corner was the half-eaten corpse of my uncle. His stomach had been ripped open and his innards were pulled all over the floor. The skin on his face had been peeled away by greedy hands to reveal the white skull. I looked back at the girl and noticed for the first time that her hands and face were stained with gore. I couldn't take it. I kneeled over and threw up before catching my balance on the doorframe and trembling. I realized what had happened in this house. Aunt Clarissa, the perfectionist she was, would never have allowed her child to have Down syndrome. So she stole a new baby from a nearby orphanage. She stole the child I knew to be Mallory. But Aunt Clarissa didn't have the heart to kill her own child, even if the baby was marred. So she kept the child hidden away under the stairs whilst being with her perfect family. However, my uncle had opposed my Aunt Clarissa, so she had gotten rid of him and used him to feed a hungry little secret under the stairs. I had to do something. I knew that I should immediately call the police. I ran upstairs and grabbed the handset that was sitting on the nearby table. I quickly punched in the numbers 911, only to look down and discover the phone lines had been cut. Aunt Clarissa kept her family under closed tabs. Simon and Eloise's home was also their prison. All of a sudden, 
I heard a shriek from downstairs. That's when I realized I left the door under the stairs open and the light on. I then heard someone running and the front door being slammed shut. I scrambled to my room and used my cell phone to call the police. I later found out that Aunt Clarissa had fled the house when she discovered her secret was out. Thankfully, the girl under the stairs turned out to be okay, but the police never found Aunt Clarissa. Even now, she's probably on the streets, maybe with a new name or face, searching for another perfect child. The first thing you should know about me is that I'm very faint of heart. There's a pamphlet I've been looking for for a while now. I remember coming across it a while ago while I was a kid. I was at the doctor's office, the waiting room, getting a physical. The year was 2002. I was born in 1996. And that's when I saw it. Strewn within the other celebrity or glamour magazines, it peeked out with one single grey corner. It was almost like it was looking at me. I picked it up and read the title. How to Talk to Yourself by a man named Roger Harrison. There was no graphic, just the white background and the aerial fonts reading the title and the author. To this day, I've never been able to find out who the mysterious Roger Harrison was. I've spent countless hours on the internet browsing for someone, anyone who remotely matched my quarry. Last week, I found a tattered piece of paper plastered to a sewer grate, colours running from the recent rain. I picked it up and I read the title. It was the very same pamphlet from my childhood. The one I remember so very clearly on that one day in the waiting room. How to talk to yourself. I quickly stuffed it in my bag. I could feel the hairs on the back of my neck stand up. The feeling you get when you're being watched. I was in a crowded square in the middle of a city. Surely it was just a coincidence. I continued home, attempting to forget the pamphlet that was lying in my bag. Perhaps I'd save it as a bit of memorabilia. Perhaps I'd trash it. I walked a little faster now. I was on the sidewalk, near the outskirts of the city. I live in a small, yellowing apartment in what you would call the fringes of the city. The building is grey and covered in ivy. I arrived at my building. I slid the key in the lock and opened the door with a creak. I felt the sudden urge to read the pamphlet. I brushed it off. With every step I took up the stairs, I could feel this sensation building more and more and more until I eventually could not take it anymore and broke into a sprint to my apartment. I opened the door, took off my backpack and grabbed the pamphlet out. The feeling of being watched had subsided now, me being safe in my own home. My neighbours were playing loud music in the room above me. The urge to read the pamphlet remained. My curiosity must have been getting the better of me. I slowly put the pamphlet down, almost reconsidering my decision, but instead decided to leave it on the kitchen table. I went into my bedroom and slipped into my covers. The time was about 10.47 as I drifted off into a deep sleep. That night, I had a strange dream. I was in a large field. The sky was grey and the grass was yellow and tall. I felt cold. The surroundings were desolate and foreboding. As I inspected the surroundings, I realised that this dream was incredibly vivid compared to most other dreams I have. As my eyes scanned the horizon, I spotted something out the corner of my eye. Almost indistinguishable, but yet I could see every movement from afar. In the distance, I could see someone. They were entirely draped in a sickly shade of green. Whoever it may have been, they were twitching. 
almost uncontrollably. I attempted to move towards them, but it felt like my feet were stuck in something. Something soft and something warm. Gelatin? Vaseline? I heard a rustling behind me, a twig snapping. I whipped around, and the dream went to black. The rest of the night, I had no dreams, and I woke up shivering, feeling strange. I brushed it off as a side effect of the odd dream. I dressed myself and brushed my teeth. I looked in the mirror. My skin was pale, paler than I've ever seen. It looked as though all my blood had drained from my body, leaving only the white skin. I walked into the kitchen and I saw it. The grey paper with its running colours, still looking at me. I was suddenly very cold. The same cold from the dream. I was intimidated. I was intimidated by a piece of paper. I don't know why. It was just so ominous and strange. I'd never felt this way about a piece of paper. I decided to pick it up. I touched the pamphlet. It was ice cold. I opened it and read. You have a special someone who lives in your lungs. They like you, but they are shy. They only come out when you're alone. Here is how to talk to them. Step 1. Breathe deeply. Say hi. You are not afraid, are you? They like you. You don't have to be afraid. It won't hurt, I promise. We are smiling at you. I was confused. Say hi? To the person in my lungs? Why are they living in my lungs? I won't hurt? And who was smiling at me? It was silent. Completely silent. I decided to do as the pamphlet said. I inhaled deeply and said, Hi, softly. Nothing happened. I decided to put the pamphlet away and save the rest of the reading for after work. I walked to the work. My co-workers were silent as they usually are. But instead of the typing of computers or movement of machines, there was nothing. Absolute dead silence. The kind of silence that makes you go mad. It was deafening. I hastily finished my work and left the building to get a cup of coffee. I arrived home about an hour later. It was now 9.24. The pamphlet lay open on the table, tempting me to continue reading it. I gave in to my temptations and picked it up and read. Step 2. Be cold. Don't go to sleep, not yet. They want to see your eyes. Take one tablespoon of the oil. Eat it. Shut your eyes. Don't yell. Don't scream. Don't. The rest of the section was undecipherable. The ink that it was written in was smudged. The second section, as expected, was equally as strange, if not stranger than the first section. Questions ran through my mind. The oil? What oil was the pamphlet talking about? This was the part that confused me the most, alongside the part that was smudged by the rain. I expected it would be some sort of brood oil, with a recipe for it. I had no idea where to start looking for the oil. Perhaps there was an explanation on the next step, I pondered. Step 3 Happy, 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 happy! Be happy! Start talking! Say how you are. You want to make them happy. You are happy. We all like to happy with you. As I thought, there wasn't any inkling as to what the oil could be. It seemed that the author, whoever he was, was almost completely losing his sanity at this point. This obsession with almost chilling happiness was starting to freak me out, and I closed the pamphlet and headed upstairs to my bedroom. I got under the covers and my head hit the pillow. I had the same dream I had last night. The only difference was that 
The man in green was closer. He was much, much closer. I woke up promptly in a cold sweat at 3.27am and I couldn't bring myself back to sleep. I had this sudden urge to go downstairs and read the pamphlet. I saw the pamphlet on the table but something was off. Everything in my desk was very organised and I saw a small envelope on my desk. I rushed towards it and ripped it open. Inside was a napkin with a crude smiley face scrawled hastily onto it. I remember specifically at this point the gravity of my situation. I had no recollection of making this note. There were no signs of a break-in, as far as I could tell. The beats in my heart began to move faster and faster as I approached the pamphlet. I opened it on the first three steps. There was the same crude smiley face scribbled all over. I caught my breath and held it for a moment before breathing out with a wheeze. I was, at this point, terrified. The questions rushed through my head. Who the hell was the man in green? And more importantly, how did all these smileys get into my apartment? I began to read the fourth step. Step four. Do you see them? Look. I was beyond scared at this point. Look at what? I was confused and I was terrified of the monstrosity I had brought into my home. Hand shaking, I read the next step. There only had to be a few left, right? Step 5. They will say hi. You have made a friend. You are not alone. You are never alone. My main question at this point was, who would say hi? Nobody was in my apartment, as far as I knew. My heart was beating a million miles an hour. Fumbling with the pages, I turned to the next and final step. Which was not really a step, but more of a statement. Final step. You are never without your happy friend in your lung. You can sleep now without waking up. The author's obsession with happiness was almost cruel to the reader. It was haunting, the way whoever wrote this put it. Somehow, my heart beat faster and faster, and I felt woozy. I was confused, terrified and alone. The last thing I remember before blacking out was a raspy breathing behind me. I woke up two days later in my bed. Had it been a dream? The paper was nowhere in sight. I walked down to the kitchen, and my eyes lit up upon the paper. It had been real. My heart sank. The sun was setting. Rubbing my bleary eyes, I picked up the paper and turned to the back. Scrawled on the back of the pamphlet was the following. Never alone, never alone, never alone. They're here, never alone. I don't like this. I'm not alone. I like you. I like you. I can see you. You little friend. I want to touch you now. Let me see you. I like you. I'm going to feel all of your little insides, my very special friend. Underneath the inscription, there was a smiley face. And from behind me, I heard a raspy, shallow voice. Hi. Pardon the sloppy handwriting, but I'm doing this on the move. We didn't mean for this to happen. Bottom line is, we made a mistake, but there's no going back now. The days, if you can call them that, have melted away into meaningless expressions of a life beyond our reach. Well, my reach. The others are gone now, leaving just me in this hell. It didn't seem like the best of ideas, sure, but in the moment, it was pure curiosity that drove us to investigate the light coming from the woods behind the apartment complex. Pure curiosity that made me follow them to get closer to something bright enough to be 
nearly blinding during the daytime. Pure curiosity that instilled a desire to extend my hand and, ever so carefully, touch it. It began to strobe, whatever it was, faster and faster. And then, everything was still. And when I say everything, I mean everything. Nothing moved, no birds chirped, no leaves settled, and no wind sighed through the trees. It was all very surreal. For a second, we thought we had killed the forest. But we quickly ruled that out when we found a couple of squirrels hovering in mid-air, appearing to have just jumped off a tree trunk. Time had stopped. We were all somewhat intelligent people, so hey, it wasn't that hard to figure out. It was great at first, running and laughing through the stillness of rush hour, high-fiving the people who had been calling for taxis, and pretty much feeling invincible. It was like a dream come true, and for the first 15 minutes, we were loving every bit of it. That's when we started dying. Sean was first. He was in the back of the group, so we all heard a faint slump. And there he was, pale and still. By the time we figured out what was happening, Katie was dead too. It was the air. It wasn't moving. Just like the leaves in the forest, the air molecules hadn't budged. The only reason we were still alive was because we unintentionally forced fresh oxygen down our throats by walking. Sean had stopped, just for a few seconds, had passed out, and died. All it took for Katie was for her to step into the vacuum left by the group's path to check on him, and the same thing happened to her. We panicked. We took off down the street, running like there was no tomorrow. There was just three of us left, Jason, Ashley, and myself. Jason kept saying that asphyxiation shouldn't, couldn't happen that fast, and Ashley cried as we ran. I didn't know what to think. We kept moving, not really heading anywhere specific, but just as long as we were moving, we were safe. There was no way to tell how long it had been, but it must have been over 10 hours of wandering. Somehow, we managed to arrive on one of the docks at the city's beachfront. The pier went quiet a ways offshore, and I didn't even think about the consequences of running out of air out there. Maybe if we had, we could have... No, we were damned from the start. Jason led the way further out, hands in his pockets, but we were all stopped short when we heard a loud crack. He slowly turned, a look of horror creeping on his face. He opened his mouth to speak, but was cut off by the rotten planks beneath him, collapsing from his weight. He should have hit the water and swam back to shore, but we didn't think about how dangerous our situation had become. How stupid it had been to go onto that pier. The name of the game had changed considerably in this twisted universe, and the water parted around his body seamlessly, forming a deep hole into which he fell. It was like nothing was there at all, like he was falling through air. We were already sprinting back towards the shore, and his screams followed us as he plummeted down into the darkness. We were only 50 feet away from the hole when it suddenly went silent. Ashley went soon after that, but ironically enough, it was from panicking, tripping on the stairs to the beach and breaking a neck. I didn't have time to stop and mourn them. I didn't have time to do anything. I could only keep moving. I began walking down 3rd Street, looking at the people, sitting frozen in restaurants, riding unmoving bicycles, walking to meet friends. I hate them. They were blissfully unaware of all that had happened. I wanted to stop and scream at them. I wanted to scream and beg for their help. 
I wanted to curl up into a ball and pray to God that I would wake up and it would be just another quickly forgotten nightmare. But I didn't do any of those things. I just kept walking. I must have been walking for a while, because I ended up miles down the highway. I wanted to stop and face death, and just let it take me. But I didn't. I wanted to sprint back to the water and wade in until I couldn't see or breathe anymore. But I didn't. I didn't do anything but walk. This is where I am now, presumably days later, walking off the last of my energy with muscles screaming for me to stop. If I do stop to rest or sleep, I'll die. I know that there's no way for me to get out of here now. Searching for this long has left me with no hope of being back in my real life again. I haven't made any decisions yet on whether I'll be the one who ends it, but I imagine I can't be far off. If only I had more time. My family has a house in the NC Mountains that my great-grandfather built a long while back. The house is my favourite place on earth, but it's insanely creepy. Everything about it is just old and alive. You never feel alone. And, honestly, it's never bothered me. It's actually been rather comforting growing up. My sister and I always share a bedroom. And between the two of us, we have at least a dozen spooky ghost stories about this house. But there was only one instance that feels too scary and unsettling to talk about. I was about 14 and she was 12. We were sitting in the basement and playing checkers because it was raining and what else is there to do? The basement isn't actually that spooky. There are three bedrooms and a lot of windows, so it's a lot of natural light. We were sitting across the room from one of the beds, the bigger one. So we were playing checkers and goofing off when suddenly I see the door handle to the bedroom across the room turn very slowly. My heart dropped. The way it was turning so slowly, like slow motion, like someone didn't want to make any noise. When the door begins to open just a crack, then a little more. I look at my sister and she's staring at it too. We're both silent, just staring. A hand. Just the fingertips at first, then the rest of the fingers. Then, an entire hand and wrist slides between the door and the door frame. So deliberate, and so, so slowly. It looks old. There is no way this is the hand of one of my family members. It is so clearly an old woman's hand. It's small and wrinkly, and the fingernails are pretty. I see it perfectly thinking about it. The hand starts to pat the wall just beside the door frame, then sliding up and down, reaching a little. The only way I can describe it is like someone looking for a light switch in a dark place. It pats and rubs the wall, making little patting and rubbing noises. Then it stops and slowly slides back into the door. The door slowly pulls closed. My sister and I were both white as sheets and completely speechless. We couldn't even talk about it. We were just silent and terrified for probably half an hour. Then we ran upstairs and told our mom, who believed us, checked it out but found nothing, of course. She told us it was probably just a friendly old ghost in need of attention. That was six years ago, and nothing that vivid has happened since. But damn, I'll never forget it.
I wasn't very old when I first saw it. Maybe about five or six or so. It was a long time ago, but I remember it well. For what feels like the longest time, the whole experience of it felt like... a dream. Like it never really happened. Just a little image in my head. A half-forgotten memory. Maybe it didn't. I can't remember exactly where the place was. Just what it looked like. As the same with people there. No faces or name I could say now. Maybe they weren't even there. Just additions by time to the memory. Slowly changing the devils in the details. But they don't matter much. They never did. What did matter was the Kelpie. It was summer. I was playing near the bayou, not far from my grandmother's house. I had been sent there to spend the duration of the warm season. My mother thought it was good to breathe fresh, humid air instead of the city smog. My summer that year was spent with my grandmother down south. She was a fierce old lady, second generation from Scotland. Often, she would tell wonderful tales of the lochs and forests from her parents' homeland, about all the creatures that lived within the waters, and all the ones that lived in the trees. One of my favourites was the Selkie, beautiful seal women who could change shape at will as they sunned on the rocks or swam in the sea. Another was the Ak Ishka, a ferocious beast, but also quite interesting to me. My grandmother said that they could take the form of a singing woman, where they would lure sailors into the ocean, and drowned them in the salt water when they got close, like sirens. The one I loved most was the unicorn. Such a majestic, mysterious creature. I liked how pure it was told to be. I had always had a desire to see one, to touch its pure, white coat. But I knew they weren't real. Just stories. Just tales. But I liked to pretend. One day, I went down to the bayou to catch a fish. I was very proud of myself, having made a pole from a stick and some string. My grandmother laughed and said, if I caught a fish, she would cook it for me. I became very determined to the task. I told her, I would be back before sundown. I waited at the banks of the water, legs crossed and pole in hand. There was a small bit of uncooked bacon on the end of the line. I knew I was going to catch a fish. I just knew it. My train of thought and concentration was broken by music. Someone playing a fiddle. The sound was enchanting. I looked around for the source. Not finding one, I tried to follow the sound, abandoning the pole on the bank with the line still in the water. I quietly crept along the bank walking until I found the source of the music. I found who was playing the fiddle. It was a young man, sitting on a branch of a large tree. The limb hung just above the water, and the young man lay against it, suspended over the mirror-like surface, playing a tune to his wooden fiddle. The white string seemed to glow in the faint morning light. He stopped when he saw me, and smiled. No words came between us, but he beckoned for me with his hand to take a seat on the mossy bank, and he continued to play. The music was wonderful. When the song ended, I asked him to play another. He nodded, but only if I went into the water. My grandmother had been very keen with me to keep out of the water. I could not swim at the time, and she made me promise to stay on the bank. So, I removed my shoes and let my feet dangle in the cool, calm water. He played another song. When he finished, he beckoned with his hand again for me to come closer, deeper into the water. Like he was going to tell me a secret and whisper it in my ear. I shook my head. I had made a promise. The young fiddler seemed sad, disappointed. I can't quite remember the details of his face, but I can just remember his frown. 
He sighed and rolled off the branch and into the dark water without a splash. Just a few small ripples came from where he entered the bayou. He never came out of the water. After that, I went back to the house as my grandmother called my name. First, I ran to get my pole. A tiny minnow was at the end of the paperclip hook. I almost told my grandmother about the young fiddler, but I didn't. She would just think it strange and say it was nonsense. The next day, I went back to the bayou banks, fishing pole in hand. I said to my grandmother, I would catch a bigger fish. I told her I would be back before sundown. I went back to my spot and sat cross-legged, pole in hand. There was a small cut of deer on the hook. I sat and waited for a fish to bite, my thoughts trailing off about my grandmother's stories. They were stopped by the sound of laughter. It was a girlish laughter, light and soft. I was curious. Usually the buyer was so lonely. Just the call of faraway birds and the hum of cicadas. But the laughter broke through it, right into my head. I followed the sound, leaving my pole on the bank and the line in the water. Moving silently, I walked along the bank. In the same place, with a low, hanging tree limb, was where I found the source of the laughter. That small, watery grove seemed just a little different. A large grey rock sat in the middle of the water, emerging from the deep. I hadn't noticed it before. Possibly I just hadn't remembered it from when I met the young fiddler. Sitting on the rock were three young girls. They looked a few years older than me. All of them had long, dark hair that swayed around them like thousands of waved silk strings. Hearing them laugh made me happy. I don't really know why. I got closer and sat on the bank to watch them. The girls were as beautiful as these selkies in the tales my grandmother told me. They all had fair skin, seemed to glow in the dimmed bayou light. One of them met her dark eyes with mine. She beckoned with a finger towards me. She wanted me to come and play. I wanted to. They seemed as though they were having so much fun up on the rock there. I took off my shoes and rolled up my pant legs. I waded in up to my knees and my feet sunk slightly in the silty mud. But looking down into the water, I remembered. I couldn't swim. I sadly stood there, sorrowful that I could not join these new friends. One by one, they slid effortlessly into the water and swam towards me. Only their eyes were visible above the water with their hair flowing behind them. They swam around my legs, barely disturbing the water. One pulled gently at my leg, another at my hand. I shook my head. I couldn't. Disappointed, they sighed dismally and let go of my hand and left slipping away like the water they swam in. Their sighs were almost musical, as melodic as they were. I didn't want them to go. I almost swam after them, but I heard my grandmother call my name. I went to get my pole. A small fry was at the end of the line. I almost told my grandmother about the bio Selkie girls, but I didn't. I felt like they were mine somehow, like a secret that only I would know. The following day, I set out again. I was going to get a bigger fish. I had to. This was my last day in the bayou. I was going home the next day. I told my grandmother I would be back before sundown and went to the bank to fish. With a pole in my hands and my legs crossed over one another, there was a small strip of gator meat at the end of my makeshift hook. I gazed out into the dark, still water. It seemed almost dead. Lovely, but dead. A metallic blue dragonfly landed on the water, took a sip, and flew off. 
I watched it go. My attention was then turned to most unusual noise. Hooves and a neigh. There were no horses in the bio, so I started to wonder. I put my pole down on the bank and let the line sit in the water. I followed the sounds of the braying horse. Yet again, I came to that same place. The willows hung low, the tree limb sat just above the water, and the rock was empty of any sulky girls. Standing by the tree on a small island bank in the middle of the water was a unicorn. It didn't have a horn, much to my disappointment, but there it was, a pure white horse. It pawed at the ground with long furred hooves. Its mane was elegant and shiny. It seemed to glow, like the sulky girl's skin and the young man's fiddle strings. It was beautiful, even if it may not have been a unicorn as the bio girls were not selkies and the young fiddler was not the singing Akishka. It looked towards me and waved its head up and down, up and down. It was calling me to it. Without hesitation, I got into the water. I didn't even take off my shoes. I stood, knee deep. The white horse trotted into the water and began to swim to me. I hoped it would play with me on the bank, or at least in the shallows. It stopped though, just a little further out from where I was. It could stand there, but then again, it was much bigger than me. The water couldn't be too deep over there, could it? It looked towards its back. It was offering me a ride. In my excitement, I forgot all about my grandmother's words and went deeper into the water, up to my chest, then my shoulders. The water felt suffocating as it went higher and higher. I felt like my lungs were being crushed under the pressure of it. I held my hand out to the white horse. It was still just out of reach. I took another step and the water was to my chin. My fingers brushed over its silky mane. Water weeds had collected in it, giving it green flecks here and there. I went to touch it again. This time though, it felt more sticky, like tape or glue. Looking down into the water, the white horse had lost its glow. It seemed more grey. Darkening the further down it went, it was almost black. Maybe it was just the water. My foot slipped. I went down under the water, opening my eyes in panic. I was horrified at what I saw in front of me. Where the white horse's belly and legs would have been, I only saw smooth, black, decaying flesh. Water weeds strewn in and out of it. The black legs fused together in a slow, fanning tail. It was like something out of a nightmare. I immediately stepped back, my movements slowed by the water. I turned around, and my head broke the surface as I reached the shallows. I scrambled onto the bank and looked back. The white horse was gone. I felt a relief, although I deeply missed the white horse. Where had it gone? I heard my grandmother call my name. In my soaked and muddy clothes, I ran by my fishing pole. A large catfish was at the end of the hook. I left both and hurried back to my grandmother's house. I told my grandmother about the white horse. I did this time. I left out the selkie girls and the young fiddler from my story. I did not mention the nature of me falling into the water but I asked her about the white horse in the water. She told me a tale about a Kelpie. It was a water demon that often took the shape of a beautiful white horse, among others such as a handsome man playing a violin or a young maiden. It would offer a ride to anyone willing, then take them into the water and drown them. Nothing would ever be found of them. 
That night, I forced myself to go back there. I needed to see if it was real. By the light of my torch, I followed the path I had taken as I searched for the source of sound. But after hours of searching, I could not find it. No green willows, no low hanging tree limb, no rock. I went back home the next day, happy to be away, yet desperate to go back. I never did, until recently. My grandmother had died about a month before. It had been years since I had seen her. In fact, she had visited only once since the time I spent a summer with her. I travelled down back to the bio, back to our home to pack up her things and sell the house. I had nearly forgotten those three days down at the banks of the bio. The whole summer had been a blur that year. But going there brought those memories back. For so long, I had dismissed it as a dream, or some dull event of meeting other people. A man playing an instrument, some girls swimming in the water, an animal on the other bank, or deer perhaps, or a white goat that had lost its way. Nothing out of the ordinary for the South. Maybe it was just my imagination that I saw a white horse and pet its mane. But to reassure myself of this childhood nonsense, I decided to go and take just one little look that morning. I would be back before sundown. I found my old fishing spot. My pole was still there somehow, as if I had just left it. I found the fresh carcass of the catfish I had left there years before. I tossed it into the waters. Curious. Then... I heard the music, fiddle music, and laughter, and the sound of a horse. I followed it, and I found the same place, the place with the willows, and the low-hanging tree limb, and the rock, and the opposite bank with the tree. Once I got there, though, all the music and laughter was gone. The tree limb sat empty over the water. The rock isolated and alone. On the opposite bank was the white horse. The Kelpie. It shook its head and beckoned me over. Something seemed strange. Not quite right. Out of place. But against my better judgment, I took off my shoes and stepped into the water. Faintly, I could hear hissing and a quite screeching sound. It sounded like it was coming from the water. I ignored the sounds and went deeper in the bio. Finally, it was getting too deep to stand. As I kicked off the bottom, my foot hit something sharp. I don't think it bled though, so I continued across the water without a thought. I couldn't shake the feeling that something was under me, swimming, maybe even multiple somethings. I climbed onto the bank. As I got close, the kelpie kneeled. It was offering me a ride. I remembered what my grandmother had said about these offered rides. I took a box knife from my back pocket and held it behind my back, just in case. Opening the blade, I stepped closer and hesitantly put a hand on the magnificent beast. Its white fur was soft and felt like water in my hands. I told myself I shouldn't. I had one of those feelings that you get going into a dark tunnel or alley. You know it could be dangerous, and most likely is, but you still go. I sheathed the knife and sat atop the white horse. It stood and pranced in a circle. I laughed. Oh, how I wish I had done this years ago. Looking up, I saw the young fiddler, laying on the low hanging tree limb. He plucked his string and began to play. He had a handsome face, with shaggy blonde hair hidden underneath a hat. His clothes looked old, like he was from the wild west. 
the three bio Selkie girls came out of the water and lay atop the rock, laughing and brushing out the water's weeds with their fingers. I noticed their faces this time. Soft, delicate features with shining dark eyes and smiling mouths. They all seemed so happy. I started to feel the same. A large grin was stuck on my face. Though, after a moment, that was replaced with a feeling of sickness. Worryment. I had a deep ache in my stomach. I was scared. But of what? I tried to lift my hand from the white horse's neck. I wanted to get off. I wanted to swim to the other bank and run away from this place. My hand wouldn't move. I pulled at it with my free hand, but it was stuck. Like it had been glued. I watched in horror as the white horse's coat began to grey before my eyes, becoming darker and darker. Finally, it became an oily black. Light shined off it in different colours. It turned its head towards me. No longer was this the beautiful creature I had seen across the bank. It was a monster. The Kelpie. Its eyes were blue and clouded, and I could see its jagged teeth through a decaying mouth. A long, greenish-black tongue lapped out of its jaws. The Kelpie's skin started to become a sticky black goo, engulfing my hand and surrounding my legs. I called for help from the young fiddler and the sulky girls. It was like they didn't notice me shouting at them. When they did finally look at me, I realised that they too were not as they seemed. No longer were the Selkie girls beautiful and long. Their skins were green and rotting. One of them was missing an eye. They gazed lazily at me with tilted heads, as if they were frowning at me with disappointment from their retracted lips and bare teeth. I had my fateful decision to ride the Kelpie. The young fiddler, his clothes torn and half of his face peeled away, plucked a few sad notes before his skin began to bubble and turn black. The Selkie girls did the same. Slowly, they all dissolved, bone and flesh, into the same black goo of which the Selkie was made of. Gradually, they dripped into the water and dissipated like ink becoming underwater smoke. As soon as they were gone, the Kelpie leapt into the water with me on its back. As it dove deeper, I tried to pull away. The melting black Kelpie skin was slowly crawling up my legs and chest. I was running out of air. I snatched the box cutter from my pocket and cut at the Kelpie's decaying flesh. It screeched and looked at me with its dead eyes. I saw my own reflection in them. It was angry. It was in pain. It looked ready to bite. I slashed at it again. And it bit at me, just inches from my face. I had freed my legs. As I tried to cut away the black flesh around my arm and hand, the Kelpie jerked and changed direction, causing the box cutter to dig into my arm. Silently screaming, I watched in horror as the last of my air escaped towards the surface. I cut at it again, and I was free. At a small glimpse, I noticed I was at the bottom. There were bones down there, human ones. In that short look, I counted at least four skulls. The Kelpie screamed and swam off into the dark water as I pulled myself to the surface. I gasped and coughed as my face was touched by the warm and humid bio-air. I looked around. Nothing was moving. Dead silent. I noticed a small ripple a few meters away. It got closer and closer. Then, it disappeared. Only a second passed before I felt someone grab my ankle and yank me back under the water. I was being dragged back down. The Kelpie seemed insistent that I never make it back to the banks. I opened my eyes to see myself face to face with the Kelpie. Its black mane flowed around it. Below me, the Selkie girls were grasping at my ankles. 
I jabbed the knife forward into the Kelpie's eye. It screamed again, such an inhuman noise that made my ears feel as though they were about to bleed. I no longer felt the hands grasping my legs. The grip around my ankle was gone. The Kelpie, screaming, swam away, the box cutter still in its eye. I swam back to the water surface. Quickly, paddling my way back to the bank, I hoped that the Kelpie would not come after me for revenge. As I reached the silty shallows, I slowly walked forward, holding my freely bleeding arm. Blood dripped into the water from my fingertips. I crawled up onto the mossy bank and lay on my back for a moment, catching my breath. I sat up and tore away the water weeds that was wrapped around me on my way to the bottom of the bio. My legs were covered in mud up to my knees, blackening at the end of my rolled up jeans. I looked around. It was nearly night somehow. The sun was gone and the first few stars had begun to shine in the darkening sky. The quiet and beautiful lagoon had changed in appearance, just like creatures that inhabited it. The rock was mossy, crumbling, cracked. The low-hanging tree limb sat broken and sticking up out of the water. All the willows were dead, their leaves decaying upon the ground in clumps. The rest of the trees looked sickly as well. Nothing here was healthy or alive. I backed further away from the water. My hand touched something smooth. Looking behind me, I saw the remnants of a polished fiddle. It looked broken, untouched for years. Further away, I saw the remnants of three colourful beach towels. They were just threads now. The skeletons of fish were around every discarded item. Looking closer in the weeds, I noticed more. Dozens of things, left behind those who rode the Kelpie. I never went back to the bio. As I sold my grandmother's house to a happily family from upstate New York and handed them the keys, I warned them not to get too close to the waters. There might be gators. As I got in my car and started to drive away, I watched as a little boy tugged at his mother's sleeve, saying, I'm going to the bio just to have a look. I'll be back before sundown. I drove away, my heart giving an empty ache for the mother of that little boy. Yes, I told myself. He'll be back before sundown. Have you ever had one of those feelings that something was wrong? I don't mean during the day either, but at night. I mean that sudden, unprovoked feeling of dread that commands you to wake. Funny, it's almost like nocturnal evil gives something off that your sleeping brain picks up on. I had one of those recently. It forced me up at 3am. Normally, when you have that feeling, you'd lay still, feigning sleep. Or, if you're feeling adventurous, you'd take a quick check around the house. After you failed to discover anything, you'd inevitably crawl back to sleep. I should have done this at this time. I should have stayed asleep. That night, I sat straight up. For the longest time, I sat there staring into the dark of my house before I even realized I was awake. Then came the fear, that slow, strangling feeling that constricts your chest and worms its way down your throat. I was alone in my home, wide-eyed and afraid with no explanation. I couldn't hear the telltale signs of a breaking downstairs or the phantom sounds of a leaking pipe. I had no reason to be freaked out, but I was. Without much thought, I got up and walked over to the window. I don't know why I did. I peeled back just enough of the curtain to poke my head through and stared out into my moonlit backyard. 
I should have stayed asleep. Outside, prancing around my garden, was a clown. It had ruffles around its sleeves and collar, baggy pants and floppy shoes. Its painted white face was even topped off with a big red rubber nose. It was without a doubt the last thing I wanted to see at three in the morning. It danced in complete silence, doing a step that only a madman or a child could understand. Its playful manner was haunting. I watched with dreadful fascination as it circled the garden, trying my best to ignore the growing lump in my throat. It moved around, pausing occasionally to play with my gardening tools or sniff the budding plants. Then it waltzed over to an oak sapling I had planted and disappeared. I blinked. This was impossible. It walked behind the thin, infant plant, but didn't come out of the other side. I should have seen it the entire time, but I didn't. It was like the clown had walked through a door, hidden by the sapling. I should have stayed asleep. I hoped that everything was some sort of waking dream. Pretending nothing happened was easier than the truth. The clown came back though. Night after night, I watched as it danced around my backyard. And at the end of every night, it would vanish the same way. One night, it disappeared behind a garden hoe, only for it to appear seconds later from behind the lawnmower. Tonight, I found it digging a hole in the middle of the yard. I've never seen it do something like this before, and my immediate thought is that the clown is digging my grave. The hole got deeper and deeper as the clown dug until the top of the hole reached its head. Once finished, it stood at the edge of the hole, motionless, when, out of nowhere, it jerked its head around. My heart pounded so hard that I could taste copper in my mouth. I'm about to tear away from the curtain when I see it bend down and pluck up a flower. The clown put the stem between its teeth and planted the shovel firm in the ground before stretching out pretend suspenders and admiring its work like a farmer. My heart was still racing at this point, but I was just glad that it didn't see me. As if the thing read my mind, it turned on its heel and stared right at me. I never thought I'd actually pray for a heart attack. It spit out the flower and ran towards me, its feet flopping to the sides. It stopped a few feet from the house, grinning at me with filthy orange teeth as it pointed to the hole and waved me over excitedly like a child showing off a finger painting. Frozen in place, the only thing I could do was furiously shake my head, no. The clown's smile fell, and it scratched its head as if confused. Then it walked over to the hole and pointed at it again. I would have told it to get lost if I could. It stood there for a moment, before animatedly acting out its aha moment. It then waltzed over to the planted shovel and disappeared behind it. I stared, wide-eyed, hoping it would reappear in the yard like before. I silently prayed for this, until the moment I heard my closet creak open. I should have stayed asleep. This happened a couple years ago when I was backpacking in Australia. I travelled around driving a van, like many backpackers there do, as it saves a lot of money with accommodation. Usually I slept in rest areas, gas stations or wherever I could park. This one night, 
I've been driving for a few hours and start to feel sleepy. I decided then to stop in the next rest area, in the middle of nowhere. Parking in that location during daytime could have been a great idea. But at night, it seemed like a horror movie location. There were no cars parked there. I know, I should park where there were more people around, but I really was drowsy. And no lights whatsoever. I turned off the engine and closed the curtains of the van. It was not long before dawn that I heard some heavy knocking on the side of the van. Open up, it's the police! Nothing wakes you up faster than that. My heart was racing. I was just adjusting to the adrenaline rush in my stream when they repeated the heavy knocking, saying it was the police. My first thought is that I parked somewhere I shouldn't. But then again, it was the middle of nowhere and it was a rest area. Before opening up, with my mind telling me that that situation was weird as hell. I decided to go slowly to one of the windows and look through the gap in one of the curtains. I could clearly see the shape slash shadow of a guy standing behind the van. His car wasn't too far, but it didn't have any lights or flashing lights. This guy was definitely not a cop. Bringing up the courage I had left, I shouted, Get the hell away! I have a gun and I'm calling the cops on the radio. I didn't have a radio or a gun, but that seemed to phase him. I saw him getting back in his car and, to add the creepiness, someone came out of the bushes and also got in the car. They left and a few minutes after that, I turned on my van and drove in the opposite direction they went to. Safe to say that I never slept in another rest area that didn't have at least a couple other cars parked. I don't know what those people wanted, but with Australia's history of backpackers serial killers, I'm very happy to be here today. I was a founding member of one of the biggest websites in the mid-2000s, but I doubt you believe me. The reason for that is because you haven't heard of it. As far as I know, I'm the only one left who has, and that's half of why I'm finally breaking down to tell my story now, nearly a decade after one of the biggest sites on the internet was removed from existence along with seemingly everyone who was involved with it. I doubt you'll believe me because even I sometimes think I might have dreamt it up in the shock following my accident in the summer of 2006, but I simply can't fool myself into believing the two years of my time I sunk into www.wallhorse.com was a fever dream or a product of a traumatic head injury. It was just as real as the semi that blindsided me or the months of PT following. But let me start at some kind of reasonable beginning. Woolhorse began as a pet project between a college buddy of mine, Al Carpenter, and the guy who always went by the screen name Ceiling Jockey, who Al had met on a web design forum while he was in his last year of high school. I met Al in the second semester of freshman year. We were both in a programming class for our major and were completely above the course level in terms of skill and sort of hit it off talking about Unreal Tournament after a particularly quick lesson. I got absorbed into his group of friends, and because I got to know Al and his friends, I got to know Wallhorse. At the time, Wallhorse had around 2,250 active users, mostly from colleges in the US. While not a particularly impressive figure in terms of numbers, the amount of growth and activity it was showing from word of mouth alone was worthy of attention. A lot of younger people don't understand the climate of the internet in 2003. The web was metamorphosing out of its original form of chat rooms and dial-up, and slowly transforming into the amazing thing you browse so casually today. But there were definitely growing pains. A huge part of the internet 
was still a mess in terms of web design and functionality and most people were still acting like it was 1998. This was the time period where you started to see a number of startups become huge. To give you an idea, MySpace went live two months before Warhorse did. So the story as I came to know from Al and his friends was simple enough. Al hated having to sort through garbage to find the interesting stuff on the internet and threw together a really basic and sloppy web page design that allowed visitors to rate websites links by giving them a thumbs up or thumbs down. He'd taken the idea to a forum where he'd met this ceiling jockey, a guy with a lot of experience as an admin who thought Al had a pretty interesting idea, but suggested integrating an account system that would allow users to submit their own websites and links and keep track of the content they liked and those that submitted it. Wallhorse ended up launching in July of 2003, with me joining in February of 2004. As I said, it already had a pretty dedicated user base by then, and Al had four of the guys besides him in Ceiling Jockey working on it by then, and as I got more and more involved, eventually became the seventh member of the team. Al was kind of rubbish at web coding and design, but Ceiling Jockey and the other four covered his weaknesses well, and Al had a talent that was rare for an internet savvy person at the time. He was a good businessman. He'd put out a bunch of lines throughout the school year, and we'd gotten a lot of traffic and interest from a number of bigger forums at the time. I recall getting a huge spike in traffic from Something Awful right before finals week that pushed us over 15k members. After that, things began to accelerate. I decided to room with the other members of the Wallhorse team that summer instead of going home, and after bouncing around helping the other members of the team as I could, I became a sort of de facto community manager, relaying and filtering the feedback we were getting from our very quickly expanding group of users. The site began to incorporate some social media aspects like heavily customizable profiles, and our first view power users started to emerge by the end of summer. We started advertising heavily through Google and banner ads, and it seemed like almost overnight, we had reached 150,000 users. The site was starting to generate money at this point, and I was shocked to be pocketing $1,000 a month from my work while going to school. Al was starting to come into his own too, and actually dropped out of school by October 2004. He was spending a lot of time working with Ceiling Jockey on the platform, but even more in correspondence with dozens of websites about advertisements and renting ad space on Wallhorse for more capital. We hit it big in January of 2005, when Al took a big risk and bought a news piece on Wallhorse that got circulated on AOL and Emerson's homepage. It cost them a lot of time and $5,000, but we went from 500,000 to 1.5 million registered accounts almost overnight. We had to buy a new server, and the service was destabilized for nearly two weeks, and despite that, we were still registering record numbers of accounts, and our traffic put us in Alex's top 100 by February. I finally had the guts to go full time with the site after I bombed my finals that May and was making eight grand a month right out the gate. Of course, there were problems. Al had run into issues dealing with some of his newer employees and had to fire two of them within a month of their hire. More pressing though, Al and Sealing were disagreeing more and more about the direction the site should go. Al was starting to get calls from people with lots of money who were very interested in what Wallhorse could become, and Seeing the Jockey did not like that. He wasn't exactly a frequent face in the site's user sections, but he did interact with them some, and the fact he was still essentially anonymous added an aura of mysteriousness to the site's most enigmatic employee. Come to think about it, I don't even think I ever knew where he lived at the time. 
I know Al was upset about having to deal with sending the guy's pay to a German bank, but he never did say exactly where he was from. Anyway, to Al's credit, he waited a damn long time before he finally started looking seriously at buyout offers. By this time, it was spring of 2006, and Warloss had hit an all-time high of 22 on Alex's ranking, and we had national attention. Television shows were putting name drops to our service in episodes. There were a couple of pop songs that had referential lyrics, and it was insane to be in the eye of the storm. So, it came to no one's surprise that Al accepted a buyout offer, but everyone was shocked when it came to $700 million. We were ecstatic, and Al threw a huge party at our office for everyone on the team, and we had a blast. That was Friday, June 2nd. I went home to tell my folks the good news that weekend and came back to the offices on Monday to a rude awakening. Al was stepping down from executive immediately and there would be a round of layoffs. I was incredibly lucky to keep my job, but nearly three-fourths of my co-workers were not. I had to watch the friends I had made over the years at Warhorse pack up their desks on the heels of the site's greatest success, but that was not as shocking as Al personally asking me to tell Ceiling Jockey that his services were no longer needed. I very reluctantly signed on to our company, IM System, and tried to lay it out as well as I could to him. To his credit, he seemed to handle it fairly well, until he asked me to put Al on for him. I called up Al, but his answer was a firm no. So, he snapped at me. He said this was wrong and it was a thing that would be regretted. I honestly couldn't say I disagreed with him. I apologised for all of this being so sudden and he signed off before I could finish with that. The whole thing left a sour taste in my mouth, but I figured that sometimes not everything worked out as you hoped. So, I rolled my office chair out up from my desk and thought about what I was going to have for dinner that night. And that's the last thing I can remember for nearly four months. It's a little anticlimactic, but the doctors told me I was hit by a semi that ran a red light. They say it's a miracle I'm still alive, and that it's twice the miracle I wasn't brain damaged to the point of being a drooling vegetable. They say I was driving a 1993 Dodge Dart. They say that my girlfriend was at the hospital within the hour and came to visit every day she could while I was fighting through the worst of it. They say that they never heard of Wallhorse.com, that I dropped out of college two years ago due to failing grades, and that I was an assistant manager at a computer repair store. I had bought a brand new 2006 Charger three days before the accident. I hadn't had a girlfriend since I was in high school because I was too busy with the sight. I guess I was lucky in my own way that the doctors attributed my muddled memories to retrograde amnesia. It kept me from letting me think about it while I was in the hospital. I can't tell you how surreal it is to have a girl you've never seen before in your life sit next to you while you lie in hospital bed with tubes down your throat tell you how it's going to be alright while she holds back tears getting visits from friends you never had who are genuinely afraid for your life, and to have the biggest thing in your life simply cease to have ever existed. No one I've spoke to since has heard or displayed any knowledge of Walhorse, and after a while, I gave up on it altogether. It's been nine years since then. It took me a year of physical therapy to walk again, and another year before my coordination was good enough to earn my driver's license again. I got married four years ago to the woman who stayed with me all through all that. I've been working from home doing computer repair, supplemented by my disability income. Honestly, I might have actually settled into thinking that Warhorse never really existed. But, I received an email three days ago that banished any chance of that notion. It was sent by CJ at Walhorse.com, 
and contained the only magnet link to a BitTorrent file. Throwing any caution to the wind, I downloaded and installed the file. Heart racing, I opened it, and the familiar Wallhorse Company IM client popped up on my screen. With trembling hands, I typed in my old username and password, and in a few moments, I was connected. Immediately, an IM notification flashed up from Ceiling Jockey himself. I opened it to find only four messages from him, dated from 2006, 2007, 2011, and 2015. I bet you regret it now, lol. I'm sorry I got angry at you guys. I do not think you deserve this. Congratulations on marrying her. She's a good woman. I'm glad something came from this for you. Please message me when you can. I want to give you something. The first message said, I bet you regret it now, lol. The second one said, I'm sorry I got angry. I do not think you deserve this. The third one said, Congratulations on marrying her. She's a good woman. I'm glad something came from this for you. Please message me when you can. I want to give you something. And the last one. It has been a long time. I'm sorry for being so angry. It was not your fault. Check your bank account. It's all I can do to apologise. I called the bank. There had been three deposits in the last 48 hours, totaling just under $2 million. So I did the only sensible thing to do. I replied to Ceiling Jockey with a simple, Apology accepted. Thank you. Uninstalled the Wallhorse IM client and scheduled to pay off the last of my medical bills. I'm planning to take my wife on vacation somewhere overseas, but I needed to get the last of this off my mind before we went. I couldn't let this stew in my head for any longer. As I type all this out, I have became painfully aware of how much has already slipped away from me about that life. I can't remember the names of people I worked with. The months go by in a blur with only a few notable dates and milestones. By the time I get back from this vacation, I probably won't even remember what Al's face looks like or the layout of the website itself. I think that might be for the best though. I haven't been able to sleep for a while. Sometimes I stay up late. I love my wife so much. So, so much. But sometimes I stay up late. My wife goes to bed and I stay up, editing or playing video games or watching TV. I'd fallen asleep on the couch as I often do, and I awoke to my wife standing over me, crying, shaking me awake. I asked her what was wrong, but for a while she didn't speak. She just hugged me and sobbed. I stroked her hair and comforted her. I wondered if she might have had a bad dream that I died or something, or if maybe she'd received a text with some tragic news. Finally, when she calmed down a little, she said, Let's just sit together for a while. Do you want to tell me what happened? I asked. She seemed to think about it and decided against it. No, I just want to spend some time with you for a little while. I'm tired, I said, stretching. Let's get in bed. No, she almost seemed to shout. No, I don't want to go into the bedroom right now. I was concerned, but my wife could be a tad eccentric, sometimes even charmingly childlike. Maybe going back there would remind her of a nightmare she had? We wound up sitting on the couch chatting about anything and everything under the sun, except for what had upset her. We played Portal, she made coffee and we snacked on some leftovers. We laughed, we reminisced about the early days of our relationship. Before we knew it, it was 7am. I'm too tired, sweetheart, and I'm sure you are too. Let's get some rest so we don't waste our entire Saturday. 
No, we can't, please, she cried. Why? I asked. What's the matter? We just can't go in there, please. If we go in, it'll be over, she said, her eyes welling up with tears. What? What's in the bedroom? I was really confused. Has she accidentally broken some heirloom? And she was afraid I'd be upset with her? There was a long silence as she fought back sobs. Then, finally... My body is in there. I'm dead, Prakash. I saw my dead body lying on the bed. Once you see it, it'll be over. This was a bit much. Obviously, she had some nightmare that she believed was real. Oh, sweetheart, no. No, it was just a bad dream. Everything is okay. I hugged her as she sobbed. Look, you're just sleep deprived. You'll feel better when you wake up, I promise. She nodded somberly, then walked silently with me to the bedroom. I gestured to the empty bed, completely devoid of bodies. See there? It was a dream. Lay here with me. I flopped onto the bed playfully and then propped myself up on my elbow to chat until we slept. She lay down next to me and closed her eyes. So, what had you dreamed? I asked. She didn't answer. Diane? I asked. Did you really fall asleep that quickly? I laughed. I shook her, and she was stiff. I noticed her lips were a little blue around the edges. Next I noticed, she wasn't breathing. Of course I panicked. Of course I called 911. She was only 27 years old. An aneurysm in her sleep. The coroner said she'd be dead for 5 or 6 hours before I found the body. I miss her so, so much. I hope my promise is kept. Wherever she is now, wherever she woke up, I hope she feels better. Sleep well, everyone. Black-eyed people, sometimes called black-eyed children, are young people, often children, with eyes that are solid black with no differentiation between sclera, pupil or iris, and are occasionally reported to have blue or bluish tinted skin like that of a corpse. Those who reported encounters with them often feel that the children were somehow supernatural and extremely dangerous, though they could not explain why. Often they can be seen playing games and singing the nursery songs Old Man Long Legs or he jumped into a bramble bush. They are usually near abandoned or deserted areas. Sometimes the reports talk of them appearing at one's doorstep, usually alone or in a pair. They appear to be unusually confident, yet shy children who avoid your gaze and look down, hiding their eyes, but speaking with an eloquency far beyond their apparent age. Often using the mannerisms and speech patterns of an adult, they occasionally even possess the voice of an adult, too. They usually attempt to talk the victim into allowing them entry into their home to use their telephone or be safe from some unspecified danger. Occasionally, when seen outside the home, they will immediately stop their play and stare at you, or, if possible, approach you, asking for a place to stay or trying to talk to you into giving them a ride home. Often, people begin to agree to their request against their better judgement, even though the request will seem vaguely unsettling, without realising why it is. Should you discover that their eyes are completely black, the children become very angry and insistent on you complying with their demands. Some people who have encountered black-eyed children feel that the children may have been using some form of low-level mind control to get them to comply. 
experiences involving the black eyed children generally do not explain the cause of the children's eye colour or the origins of the children themselves. Sometimes thought to be the spirits of lost or murdered children, the black eyed children are thought to be the harbingers of ill will and personal doom. The encounters frequently emphasise that the children must be voluntarily admitted or invited into the house or car in question, and in this way are reminiscent of some vampire legends. However, it is unspecified what happens should you comply with their demands, as no reports of the black eyed children have included that happening, possibly indicating the death of those that comply. My internet service provider used to have offices in a shopping centre before they moved to their, comparatively, lush accommodations elsewhere. There was a drop box at their original location. The monthly bill was due, and thus, there but for the grace of the net, I went. It was about 9.30pm when I left, from my relatively isolated apartments. It's about 10 to 15 minutes or so to downtown. Ebeline has a population of about 110,000. Right next to Camelot Communications' old location is a $1.50 movie theatre. At the time, the place was featuring that masterwork of modern film, Mortal Kombat. I drove by the theatre on the way to the centre and pulled into an empty parking space. Using the glow of the marquee to write out my cheque, I was startled to hear a knock on the driver's side window of my car. I looked over and saw two children staring at me from the street. I need to describe them with one feature, you can guess what it is, that I didn't realise until halfway through the conversation cleverly omitted. Both appear to be in that semi-mystical stage of life children get into where you can't exactly tell their age. Both were boys, and my initial impression is that they were somewhere between 10 to 14. The first boy was the spokesman, the second boy didn't speak during the entire conversation, at least not in words. The first boy was slightly taller than his companion, wearing a pullover, hooded shirt, with a sort of grey checkered pattern and jeans. I couldn't see his shoes. His skin was olive coloured and had curly, medium length brown hair. He exuded an air of quiet confidence. Boy number two had pale skin with a trace of freckles. His primary characteristic seemed to be looking around nervously. He was dressed in a similar manner to his companion, but his pullover was a light green colour. His hair was a sort of pale orange. They didn't appear to be related, at least directly. Oh great, I thought, they're going to hit me up for money and then the air changed. I've explained this before, but for the benefit of any new lurkers out there, right before I experience something strange, there's a change in perception that comes about which I describe in the above manner. It's basically enough time to know it's too late. So there I was, filling out a check in my car, which was still running, and in a sudden panic over the experience of the two little boys. I was confused, but an overwhelming sense of fear and unearthliness rushed in nonetheless. The spokesman smiled, and the sight for some inexplicable reason chilled my blood. I could feel fight or flight responses kicking in. Something I knew instinctually was not right, but I didn't know what it could possibly be. I rolled down the window very very slightly and asked, Yes? The spokesman smiled again, broader this time. His teeth were very, very white. Hey mister, what's up? We have a problem. He said. His voice was that of a young man, but his diction, quite calm and something I couldn't put my finger on, made my desire to flee even greater. 
You see, my friend and I want to see the films, but we forgot our money. He continued. We need to go to our house to get it. Want to help us out? Okay, journalists are required to talk to lots of people, and that includes children. And I've seen and spoken to lots of them. Here's how that usually goes. Uh, um, uh, mister, can I see that camera? I won't break it or anything, I promise. My dad has a camera, and he lets me hold it sometimes, I guess. And I took a picture of my dog. It wasn't very good, because I got my finger in the way and... Add in some feet shuffling and or body swaying, and you've got a typical kid talking to a stranger. In short, they're usually apologetic. People generally teach children that, when they talk to adults, they're usually bothering them for one reason or another, and they should at least be polite. This kid was in no way fitting the mould. His command of language was incredible, and he showed no signs of fear. He spoke as if my help was a foregone conclusion. When he grinned, it was as if he was trying to say, I know something, and you're not gonna like it. But the only way you're going to find out what it is will be to do what I say. Uh, well, was the best reply I could offer. Now, here's where it starts to get strange. The quiet companion looked at the spokesman with a mixture of confusion and guilt on his face. He seemed, in some ways, shocked. Not with his friend's brusque manner, but that I just didn't immediately open the door. He eyed me nervously. The spokesman seemed a bit perturbed too. I still was registering something wrong with both. Come on, mister, the spokesman said again smooth as silk. Car salesman could learn something from this kid. Now, we just want to go to our house, and we're just two little boys. That really scared me. Something in the tone and diction again sent off alarm bells. My mind was frantically trying to process what it was perceiving about those two figures that was wrong. Uh, um was all I could manage. I felt myself digging my fingernails into the steering wheel. What movie were you going to see? I asked, finally. Mortal Kombat, of course, the spokesman said. The silent one nodded in affirmation, standing a few paces behind. Oh? I said. I stole a quick glance at the marquee and at the clock in my car. Mortal Kombat had been playing for an hour, the last showing of the evening. The silent one looked increasingly nervous. I think he saw my glances and suspected that I might be detecting something was not above board. Come on, mister, let us in. We can't get into your car until you do, you know, the spokesman said soothingly. Just let us in and we'll be gone before you know it. We'll go to our mother's house. We locked eyes. To my horror, I realised that my hand had strayed towards the door lock, which was engaged, and was in the process of opening it. I pulled it away, probably a bit too violently, but it did force me to look away from the children. I turned back. Uh, uh, um, I offered weakly, and then... My mind snapped into focus. For the first time, I noticed their eyes. They were coal black, no pupils, no iris. Just two staring orbs reflecting the red and white light of the marquee. At that point, I know my expression betrayed me. The silent one had a look of horror on his face in a combination that seemed to indicate a... The impossible had just happened, and B, a look of, we've been found out. The spokesman, on the other hand, wore a mask of anger. His eyes glittered brightly in the half-light. Come on, mister, he said. We won't hurt you, 
You have to let us in. We don't have a gun. That last statement scared the living hell out of me. Because at that point, by his tone, he was plainly saying, we don't need a gun. He noticed my hand shooting down towards the gear shift. The spokesman's final words contained an anger that was complete and whole, and yet contained, in some respects, a tone of panic. We can't come in unless you tell us it's okay. Let. Us. In. I ripped the car into reverse. Thank goodness no one was coming up behind me and tore out of the parking lot. I noticed the boys in my peripheral vision, and I stole a quick glance back. They were gone. The sidewalk by the theatre was deserted. I drove home in a heightened sense of panic. Had anyone attempted to stop me, I would have run on through and faced the consequences later. I bolted into my house, scanning all around, including the sky. What did I see? Maybe nothing more than some kids looking for a ride. And some really funky contact lenses. Yeah, right. <laughs>